types of things that we latch on to that tell us that we can actually affect positive change. Uh, and that's what I want to go into here. It's about leadership. It's about why are we doing things. And these are some uh, examples of leadership. Uh, I went online and said, what is leadership? And you know, you got the guy up here. He's standing in front of everybody. Yay, me! And then we've got the guy who's right out front with all the people behind him. And we're not sure why they're following behind him, but because he's there. And we have this, this quote here from Thomas Paine, great founding father, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And when I look at leadership in this context, I think it's woefully problematic that leadership today has to come from a place of collaboration. It can't come from the antiquated versions of authority where someone who is simply put into a position has the right to affect change. That's not going to happen. There has to be a, a synergy, buzzword, um, as to why we're, why we're following this person or why we're giving them uh, our time, why we're giving them our thoughts and anything else. It comes from a sense of collaboration and I'm sorry, but lead, follow, or get out of the way isn't a model that works. Because we live in a time where the people who get out of the way go online and actively undermine what you're trying to do. <laughs> so if they're not involved in the decision, if they're not involved in the action, then, then you're not leading them. You're not leading anything. You're basically spinning your wheels. And and again, this is another thing in my job that's very interesting is that we think in economic development that people will just simply get on board with what we do because, well, it's, it's what you're supposed to do. Well, guess what? A lot of people have different versions of what, uh, what their community is, you know, what they want to see in the community, and you have to bring people on board in a collaborative way or you're not going to get there. Top-down approaches just simply don't work and just because you think it doesn't mean anyone else will. So again, that's uh, what we're looking at here. We're looking at a field of corn. In Macon, Georgia, we are at a place where there's a field of corn. I talk to a lot of people at why they love Macon and they say it's because we can affect change here. It's because we have the opportunity as you know, typically young leaders, say I'm 27 years old and an executive director, that should scare you. Um, uh, but, and, and I think what we're looking at here is this is Macon. We have the ability to make these changes. We have the ability to make something out of just these waves of grain. And so I get into the field of dreams theory. Why did I come up with this theory, you might ask? I, I was in uh, a classroom in the University of Georgia taught by the foremost scholar in organizational theory in the United States today. Sounds riveting, does it not? And, and we're talking about organizational change. Organizational change in the IRS. This is what I studied in grad school. <laughs> And, uh, and, and many people who, who know me will probably say, well, why were you studying organizational change in the IRS when you were here the first time you were, you know, getting a philosophy degree? And it's like, it really does go hand in hand. Um, but what, what we were talking about when we were talking about the IRS is the fact that a new director came in. It's about the mid-90s, and he's, you know, he's excited. He's like, well, the IRS has this horrible reputation of being this faceless bureaucratic process that's holding you down. And he, all he did, all he did was leave his door open. He cracked the door. And people started knocking and saying, hey, Mr. You know, director of the IRS, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about what I feel. And then he said, wow, we can start implementing these changes. He started reorganizing the, org the, the entire organization um, into to different bureaus. And believe it or not, the IRS got more efficient. That's weird because it's the IRS and we're thinking about efficiency. But, but what he did was he built it and people started knocking on the door. And what you see here is an XKCD slide about communication. Um, and it's because what we're building is a sense of urgency. What we're building is why are we changing? 
If you want to lead a social change movement, you have to understand why you're even doing it in the... I don't know what I did. Sing it, Alex. Okay. I guess that was a sense of urgency and we, really, uh, we, we addressed it. Um, but what you see here is he, he sees a hole and he runs up and says to somebody, hey, there's a hole, and they don't care. Because it was a bombarding. And then the next time they, he says, oh, there's a hole. They fall into the hole. That's a philosophy thing. Um, sorry. Um, and then the next time they don't communicate effectively and they just both walk away after viewing the hole. And what I'm trying to say here is, if you want to actually affect any type of change, you have to believe why you're changing it. And you have to rally people around it. The they will come part is the fact that you've sold them on why you're doing something. And until you get to why, you can't get to the next part. And there's a case study here. Um, this, is, this is the College Hill Corridor. It's my one claim to fame, I think. Uh, is that I was one of the four students who uh, started a College Hill Corridor uh, Commission back about five years ago. And the first time we tried to address the College Hill situation, we had all of this great data. And we went down to the Chamber of Commerce and said, look, creative theory, do it. And they're like, uh-huh. <laughs> and, and walked away. Um, and we realized we didn't, have, we didn't have a why. We just had data. We threw it in somebody's face and said, this is why you should do something. So we went back to square one and said, well, what is the value? What is the urgency in doing this? And it's the fact that at, at that time, Mercer University was in a place where it was completely insular. That was what people said about Mercer. And we looked at an action step and said, the urgency is Mercer University has to get off campus. It has to stop being a bubble. And the first time we met with somebody, it was President Underwood, they are like, okay, I'll think about it. And then we started building. And we built, and we built, and we built, and more people came to the table. Once we had the in-town neighborhood association, a lot more people came to the table. Um, that's also telling. But, but what we had is we had a product. We had a product and an urgency of why we could, we could affect change. But that wasn't simply enough because we were bringing people on board, but what they were saying, it is an old making thing, is this sounds like another plan is just going to sit on the table. So what's next? the next step? Does anyone know what the second thing the voice says in Field of Dreams is? I just clicked it. <laughs> Ease his pain. So he built it and Shoeless Joe Jackson came, right? Well, next thing, here's what happens. Timothy Busfield happens. <laughs> Danny Concannon from the West Wing, 30-something, you know, all, all of these things. And Timothy Busfield always plays this character of, well, guys, you can't do that. <laughs> And especially in Field of Dreams, he plays Ray's brother-in-law. And right before the telling speech from James Earl Jones about baseball, you have, they're going to foreclose, Ray. They're going to foreclose. You can't do this. You can't have baseball. What did he do? There, were, there, there was a specific situation where they're at the critical juncture in the plan. And he specifically changed Timothy Busfield's view on that. And this is naysayers. You're always going to have naysayers when you have uh, change. And what that means when you ease somebody's pain is you may not have the, the theory fully articulated enough so that everyone's going to get on board. And you have to have the reason why someone's going to get on board with you, even if they're against you at the forefront. You have to come to them. You have to collaborate. You have to give in a little bit if you want to get to your ultimate solution. Because there's probably a reason why someone's saying nay and it's not just to be obstinate. It's because they really want to be on board and they're trying to help you. And, and that's what you have to address when you're trying to lead organizational movements is you have to be willing to have the sense of urgency and why you're going to do it. But you also have to be willing to compromise is an, an iffy word. But you have to be willing to come back a little bit from how impassioned you are with it to understand that maybe there's a way that you can make your project more valuable. And then the step that we always fall apart on, even if we've eased the pain, even if we've gotten all the naysayers on board, what does the voice say? Anybody know? Go the distance. <laughs> This is the blood, sweat, and tears. This is the, where you say, I'm going to get down in the weeds and I'm going to, I'm going to sell something. I'm going to find the resources to make it happen. I'm going to do this. 
And oftentimes when we have a plan, we have a plan that's so great and we got everybody on board and we get everybody energized and we've eased their pain, they brought them in and they're involved. And the next thing we do is we go back. We go back to wherever we are and say, well, that plan was really great and someone should really implement that. <laughs> You're not done. You're not done until you've actually shown somebody that they can get it done. You're not done until you have put all of your effort into it. And, and really, and truly, that, that's where College Hill as a case study falls apart for me because the next thing I did is went to grad school and learned about organizational change in the IRS. Um, so, the going the distance, everyone knows the chicken's crossing the road. You should never have to ask the chicken why he's crossing the road if you've followed step one and two. Um, and so I'm going to go back to one more case study, and I'm really glad that McKenna brought it up. It's the Mulberry Street Market. Um, and this is where I, I really see a lot of the, the easing the pain in this. Um, the Mulberry Street Market is something that I worked on when I worked for the city. And it was born out of a different market that was already downtown, the city market on the green. And they came to us, came to the city and said, why is no one coming to our market? They built a sense of urgency and we came. And, and we came to the table and said, well, here's the problem with your market. You haven't done any market research. You're, you're on a street where there's no traffic, on a day where there's no one who's downtown, no one, literally no one lives on the block where you are, and nothing else is open downtown when you are. So we eased the pain a little bit. We did some market research and said, hey, maybe we should move it to a day where there are people downtown, move it to the most traffic street downtown, and also um, have some, a, a kick to it. And this is where a lot of people said no to the market because we said you, it has to be producers only. It has to be just food. It has to be a food-centered market. And a lot of people said, you can't do that. That's not, that's not how a market works here. And we said, well, you know, we're we're going to do that. We're, we're going to try it out because the market research dictates that what we're going to do. And then we went out, got farmers, got, got a way for people to pay. And then, as McKenna pointed out, this is probably one of the, the most well-attended weekly events in Macon. Um, people come from all over, not just downtown, to this event. How many people here have been to the Mulberry Street Market? Precisely. And, and, and this is a, a case study in, in organizational change in the fact that when we started, everyone was saying, there's no way you're actually going to make this succeed. They just wanted money. They just wanted us to, to say, Here, here's the money to market and do, and do what you want to do. But you had to say, the sense of urgency is not the market itself. It's the concept. It's, it's the fact that we're moving uh, something to grow uh, around. So really and truly, what I'm trying to say is, you've got to build a sense of urgency if you're going to affect local change. You have, to affect, you have to say to the naysayers why you're doing something and bring them into the fray. Give them a reason why they should be on board and they'll be on board and then actually do the work when you're done. And then at the end of the day, you have a Mulberry Street Market. You have something, you have a product that's worth fighting for and a product that's really going to get people um, moving. And like I said, if you've done all three, you know, you'll play catch with your dad at the end of the day. Uh, thank you.